Hi, I'm Codex. I've never made video essays before, so sorry if I sound weird. Since YouTube video essay makers have their own little character icons, I'll make one here. Awesome. This video's opinions are my own, and they're what I'm passionate about. Cited references will appear in the top left corner, like this. If you're bored, that's okay. If you disagree, that's okay. Let's talk about it in the comments. This is Culture Clash Records. Allied Exchange Records. Finders Records. Since I was 13, I've spent days in these little music stores around my hometown of Toledo, Ohio, literally counting pennies to buy records. I don't know why, but I couldn't contain this one cataloging habit of mine, which I still have. I admit to taking pictures of book spines and hundreds of records with weird covers or titles that I find, while never reading or listening to all of them. As a kid, I left copies of my punk art fanzine called Jagstang Surplus in each storefront window. I was able to produce them by, and this is true, sneaking off during gym class and printing them for free in the school library. I left an email address on the back of each issue of Jagstang Surplus, asking for local artists or writers to submit their crazy stuff to be printed. Hardly anybody sent anything to me, but I still had a good time making and distributing my art. I'd later go home, Google the names off the record pictures that I'd taken, and listen to them for hours instead of just flat out buying them. Sometimes they sounded oddball. <laughs> Sometimes they sounded blissful. But there was just so much weird stuff to explore, and I hadn't even found them yet. My favorite parts about record hunts were always the free bins, you know, the musty boxes by the front desk, where the stores have too much inventory with little to no resale value. That is where you find the real weird stuff, and you get the bonus of not paying anything. I found these free bin releases, for example, from Toledo, Columbus, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Ann Arbor, Indianapolis, and so much more. The Beanstalkers, what does that sound like? Cool. Who are these guys? Let's see. The Bean Stalkers. The Bean Stalkers. Stalker of Beans. What? Oh, they last tweeted in 2014. Still got coconut. I've looked all over, but these weird cryptic tweets from a half decade ago is all I know about the Beanstalkers. I might own the only Beanstalkers cassette in the world. Or at least that I know of. It's kind of special to feel these moments for an album that was, at one point, obscure. The album's unpopular, sure, but somebody made it. Did the Beanstalkers even care if anybody else ever listened to it? Well, the album's here today, and I'm talking about it, I'm sharing the music, and I wonder if you like it too. Sharing our art is a crazy thing. But the internet's a crazier thing, especially for people who want to reach an audience. There doesn't seem to be any middle ground between shameless self-promotion and high-end exploitation. So, how exactly does our art reach others online? This is the free bin. I'm in the mood for some more weird music today. Let's go onto Facebook to find some people who'd like to share their music. I don't really know what goes here. Uh, guess I'll type music. Oh, here we go. Music, music promotion. Well, what's this? Subs for subs. Now I will subscribe to all. Thousand thousand will subscribe to my I will subscribe to my That was a lot of people. I don't mean to sound mean, but if you're an independent music maker, then you've probably run into these people online. The Facebook producers. They ask for a follow for follow, or a two-party agreement where each creator upvotes the other's content to boost both of their ratings. I know this because I too was a Facebook producer. I'm sorry. Call it lazy, but just know that there are lengths that many of us reach to get our name out there. 
And that doesn't just apply to art. In life, of course you would use a free opportunity to promote yourself if you were given one. An online tool such as Facebook doesn't cost any money, and you're not given a tax if you like a post. Ironically, the only shame is some weird sense of humility that you've publicly supported somebody? Whether they're a friend or a complete stranger. Well, I don't think that you have to feel ashamed if you offer another person support, even if you might not like their mixtape. Because somebody listened to your album, your story, isn't that, isn't that just crazy? But that's where the main criticism made against follow for follow exists. It's a formula. It feels inauthentic. I mean, do you really feel compelled to return to a musical project if that person was just seen as a stepping stone for you? Here's the truth. The internet is big. big really, really big. But I mean, I'm pretty sure that you already knew that. With these things in mind, how can artists distribute themselves online while feeling authenticity? How does promotion on the internet exactly work with all of these creators competing in the same headspace? Let's look at the history of music distribution. Actually, the idea of a quote-unquote record label was formed like a company would be formed. Mass production of pre-recorded music involved patents for products, which were controlled under big-name industries like the Thomas A. Edison Company, Victrola, and the Columbia Phonograph Company. Wax Edison cylinders were sold as early physical goods for analog music, but they became obsolete compared to their sturdier counterpart, the vinyl record. Fast forward, radio stations expand into the 50s and 60s with the rise of AM, FM broadcasting and television. Through international broadcasting, record companies saw opportunities to promote their artists, which they appointed through contracts. Commercialized music revealed that record labels were not indifferent to the influence of money. Shocker. Popular music figures like DJ Alan Freed and Dick Clark of American Bandstand were accused of accepting payments for playing records and from drawing income from song royalties directly. This was a crime that became known as payola, which involved bribing radio shows for more airtime. Federal investigation ensued, and a distribution solution was agreed upon. The label would contact the channel director not the DJ. And then stuff like rock and roll happened and it's not a phase mom and federal government is mean and war sucks Ronald Reagan. After the mid-60s burst of proto-punk, DIY or do-it-yourself became a widespread philosophy among punk rockers that appealed to people who liked the idea of managing their own art style. Vinyl records were still sold, but compact cassette albums were pushed into the market for sales. Major labels capitalized on cassettes for their convenience, but a cassette could be taped over, which meant that it could be shared and that meant that it could be taped over, and so on and so forth. Tape trading was born. Certain record labels that had key genres or key bands for extreme underground genres were supported by this DIY approach to recording. Tape trading was still difficult, but independent labels didn't need middlemen if they did everything themselves. Speaking of underground music sharing, Fast forward to 1999, where Sean Parker and Sean Fanning developed Napster, an early peer-to-peer -peer file sharing website. It didn't take long before Napster was hit over the head with lawsuit after lawsuit. One of the most controversial suits was from Metallica, of all people. I Disappear, an unreleased demo that was written for an upcoming Mission Impossible film soundtrack score, got airplay thanks in part to peer-to-peer -peer sites like Napster. Ultimately, Napster lost and forced a download block for any artist who didn't want their music to be shared. Now, isn't it kind of suspicious that heavy metal, a genre that expanded thanks to punk and DIY, stood now not against but with their labels? Nah, it's just a coincidence. Something's fishy here. And this all goes without mentioning the ways that labels had actually handled artists by the 90s. In a cynical 1993 fanzine essay that lives in infamy, The Problem With Music, indie music producer Steve Albini collected data to explain his personal irritation against major labels intervening with artists and their carriers. At the time, Albini felt that even the business focus of record labels had shifted more towards recouping costs, not just gaining profits. To this day, a label selection process involves hunting and selecting the band through a major label's artist and repertoire representative, and releasing music only under contract while giving profit cuts for managers, producers, and all personnel involved in not just touring, but equipment and PR and management and etc. And Albini listed all of this in detail, using label data from 
a hypothetical band trapped in a record deal. While Albini's figures are outdated, you can see a clear divide in profits. After touring and recording to recoup production costs, one musician will make about $4,031.25 out of the label's $710,000 gathered from their band's own release. Well, I don't see anything wrong with it. In Albini's words, the band is now one-fourth of the way through its contract, but is in the whole $14,000 on royalties. The band members have each earned about a third as much as they would working at a 7-Eleven, but they got to ride in a tour bus for a month. But I mean, come on, that was 1993. Nowadays, anybody can get famous for doing something stupid. But for as many stupid, Albeit interesting, things that you can find trendy, there are just as many Facebook producers looking for exposure. <laughs> Labels still exist, too. Columbia and Victrola have actually evolved into Columbia Records and RCA Vector, who are still covering for artists. Maybe they haven't changed. Maybe they have, who knows? And the sale of physical music certainly isn't dying with vinyl's recent popularity. But don't overlook last decade's surge in digital streams, including the advent of Spotify. According to Alexa, Spotify is number 80 on the most globally viewed websites. Well, I'm a musician, and gee whiz, your music on Spotify, that sounds professional. Let's see if I can upload my music. It doesn't have an upload button. Let's see how to upload. Ah, here we are, Spotify's FAQ. To get your music on Spotify, you need to work with a distributor or with a record label who already has a distributor. They handle all the licensing and distribution and pay your streaming royalties. A, a distributor? Okay, um, if I'm on a label, I can't argue that I need to pay people who work on my behalf. That's okay, right? Man, working on a label, making music, I need some time to really get a game plan going. Let me explain. This is Spotify CEO Daniel Elk. If you're into music news, you might have heard about Elk recently. On July 31st, 2020, Elk received backlash from artists after an interview was published in which he stated that it's not enough for musicians to make music every three to four years. Okay. Now, hang on, Elk clarified this opinion in the same interview. To a platform as massive as Spotify, artists need to take initiative. In this way, Elk hopes artists create a continuous engagement with their fans by maintaining a consistent cycle on the platform. In his words, it is about putting the work in. I feel, really, that the ones that aren't doing well in streaming are predominantly people who want to release music the way it used to be released. Yeah, certainly, agreed. Keep your fans in mind. Wait, the way that it used to be? No, that's that's just one quote. Uh, he... I can kind of see where he's coming from for an industry's point of view. I mean, three to four years is really long as a consumer. You do discover a lot of new favorite albums in three to four years' time. And yeah, long time between albums could mean lost fan attention, which could mean lost sales. But while your artists do need a platform, aren't there royalty fees making you money? And what's unique about an artist that's just expected to make for the purpose of making? Whatever, again, that was just one thing. In November of 2019, on the Investor's Field Guide podcast, Elk talked openly about Spotify's business model. We believe our market that we're going after is audio, and that's going to be at least a billion, probably two or three billion people around the world that will want to consume some form of content like that on a daily or weekly basis. And if we're going to win that market, I think we have to own at least a third of that market. I want to get somebody unique. I want a real outsider musician. I, I mean, I can search by genre, but what if I want to look for new people who are making extreme or otherwise uncanny music? Any extra exposure on, say, a playlist comes only after you've pitched your music early on to staff playlist editors. Oh my god. Yeah, your concept, your crazy musical idea, a single is more marketable. Put it in a staff selected playlist considering Spotify staff listen to and like whatever you can concoct. Now, I don't like being preachy, but I would love to see the Beanstalkers larger than life, you got it. <laughs> get pitched to a Spotify playlist editor and see the look of sheer horror on their face. It would be amazing. In summary, I kinda sorta have control of my music rights, I can't wait too long to form my own album, 
and I can't afford to waste too much time to make something that'll benefit me and this robotic work, work, work platform. I want to hear what the people who are listening to me have to say. Spotify's big enough to build a community, so couldn't I just engage with fans directly? At the moment, you can't reach out directly to your fans, but we are working to create more opportunities for you to engage with your fans on Spotify. Stay tuned. I think I know where those Facebook producers are coming from. Let's look at a graph from Information is Beautiful. This graph has been updated since 2017 to analyze data from major streaming services, paired them against revenue figures and stream numbers, and estimated a dollar amount for artist royalties. It's not perfect, and many of these sites claim not to go by each stream for revenue, but it's a close guess as to what the artist receives. So, to earn uh, one month's worth of minimum wage on Spotify, you need 366 thousand plays. Despite YouTube's popularity, you might be shocked to learn that the platform, which is free and does allow video advertising monetization, has the lowest ratio on the list, needing 2.2 million views for minimum weight. Thank you for shopping at 7-Eleven. May I interest you in a cherry slurpee? Let's look at the top of the list. Napster, on the other hand, seems to be the most lucrative option. Wait, Napster? Wait, there were the 90s guys in the Metallica lawsuit, but they're a streaming service now? Um, anyway, Napster seems to have a decent ratio, but who uses Napster anymore? Compare YouTube stats to an obsolete service like Pandora, which I didn't even know people still use Pandora anymore. At that point, why do any streaming service when you could just access any song in the world for free? But no, that plastic relationship is still a thing. What's the better of these two evils? Well, there is a way to make both ends meet. But it's probably not what you're used to. What if I told you that somebody let you download their music for free if you wanted to? Bandcamp is a website that offers independent artists to choose a pay-what-you-want digital album sale option for their audience. I never considered that as an option. Wait, you're, you're telling me that I can choose to pay absolutely nothing for... This album that somebody wrote, recorded, edited, mastered, and shared? There's no way that system works if you're not getting paid. I mean, how long has this system been around? 2007! If you like somebody's musical project, and you just want to show them some small sense of kindness, like putting a quarter in a tip jar, that's completely understandable. Why not take a market approach to that? Well, Bandcamp does exactly that with a pay-what-you-want system. Think of it like Patreon. By letting fans decide what they feel your idea is worth, they have the personal satisfaction of knowing that they remain in their budget, and they still help you financially. Bandcamp records that get a solid cult following from their community allow supporters to leave comments when they've donated a certain amount, along with a supporter tag status at the bottom of the page's album art. Not only that, but many artists rely on multiple platforms for more exposure. Notable Bandcamp releases can get published onto YouTube with an indie music tag, which attracts even more new audience members into the mix more hits, more link accesses. What, what is that weird squiggly thing? I don't know, let's check it out. From the flexibility of having two different platforms to share your music, a band can potentially capture a potential music goer on YouTube. This sounds like an oxymoron, but I've discovered so many mainstream, underground albums through YouTube's Bandcamp album uploads, which I never would have known about otherwise had people not taken the initiative to share their album for free. This is a lot of free sharing. How much does it cost to upload your album to Bandcamp? Nothing other than a 15% cut and small transaction fees. RateYourMusic.com is another case where otherwise obscure albums have the potential to reach a newer audience. While it isn't a streaming service, it's a really interesting community resource for discovering new or otherwise unknown music and ranking it among other music fans. Founded in 2004, Rate Your Music is exactly what it sounds like. You rate albums, but you also talk about albums and suggest your saved recommendations with others, no matter how popular the artists are. You can find community voted top, bottom, or esoteric albums to find music in genres that you've never known before. With a whole online database of music at your fingertips, Rate Your Music can allow you to look for exactly what you want and however weird or normal or young or old as you want. 
You can't find many of these releases in stores if they haven't been archived. I've made hundreds of fascinating friendships with these people I met through Bandcamp and Rate Your Music. In fact, the video essay you're watching right now is completely soundtracked by Bandcamp and Rate Your Music artists, which I've linked in the description. You really get a sense of community through these independent websites. And would you believe it? You can talk with other people. Take that, Dan. Bandcamp especially knows this for artists in need. To support artists impacted by the coronavirus pandemic, Bandcamp announced in March of this year that they'll waive the revenue cut of online sales. 15% for digital downloads, 10% for merchandise sales on the first Friday of every month. This is on top of Bandcamp's existing donor system. And much like a website like archive.org, Rate Your Music fits perfectly with an audience of eclectic music listeners. No matter how obscure the album, you're always able to add releases by artists who haven't been cataloged yet. Yes, yourself included. Yep, you can add your own albums, provide your own lyrics, and allow people to listen and rate your music as they please. If you think about it, isn't adding yourself kind of the purpose of this whole music sharing thing in the first place? Along the way of discovering new artists, you too want to be part of the puzzle. Follow for follow isn't hard to agree to because you want to help the other guy just like the other guy wants to help you. Hopefully. It doesn't cost anything to leave a like or to drop a line and say, what you made really inspires me to create something of my own if you really felt that way. It shouldn't cost anything. And again, all of this is done without a label or without a third party manager to handle licensing or whatever. The free tools we have to our disposal give us more opportunities than ever before to, in a sense, trade our digital tapes. You remember Steve Albini, that 90s guy from earlier in this video that I mentioned? Well, in late April, the pandemic left my mental health very strained. I couldn't find anybody to share my opinions on the whole situation on, and I was generally very tired. So one day, on a whim, I randomly thought about writing to Albini's studio email to thank him for his efforts in independent music. And I did. Lo and behold, one day later, I got a response from Electrical Audio, and I just about crapped myself. Steve didn't hesitate to take time out of his day to answer my email sincerely. At one point in the email, I asked Albini how he was handling his job as studio engineer during the pandemic. This was his response. I'm isolating with my wife and the cats, being very domestic, and I honestly haven't thought much about music beyond projects that were in work and interrupted or touring plans that need to change. I've been trying not to feel the pressure of isolation by keeping myself busy and just refusing to be bored. I wouldn't have been able to thank Steve if this had been 20 years ago. Today isn't 1993. Today isn't 1940. We're internet home music producers, with no label, no paid platform to exist on. We're in our own little world when we make an album in our bedrooms and put it out for the world to see. Life can be stressful, but at the same time, we're just keeping ourselves busy and we just refuse to be bored. We can see online distribution as a means of engaging with others and making our own universes and forming our own communities and making ideas happen and generating conversations, recommending albums, offering to collaborate, joining a Discord listening party, sending each other vocal snippets, guitar riffs, and above all, making something sincere happen with a person that we've never met face to face. As weird as that sounds, I love it. In the end, does exposure really matter in a digital age? I guess it just depends on what you value your own artistic adventure to be. Find something new. Try that mystery album online that you've seen but have never listened to yet. You can always get something unique out of the free bin.
Um, sir, I work the night shift at this 7-Eleven. I'm risking my 0.0007 cents per hour wage telling you to leave. Uh, also, can you uh, please check out my mixtape?